Well, anyways, for me, you know, I was at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and my goal was to help the department grow there. It was mainly made up of uh, clinical staff, you know, the people in the community. And I got to know Ossoff through going to his laser courses, and then I became a uh, co-director of the uh, laser course. We used to do nine laser courses a year down in Northwestern. So my mentor and partner, Bob Tuville, at the Medical College of Wisconsin used to ask me when I was going to be around to work at the Medical College of Wisconsin. So it's down at Northwestern a lot. Uh, so Bob and I got to know each other, and we did some research projects together. And he always wanted to be a chairman. And you all probably know the history here. I mean, we all, four of us know that the department was uh, ended in 1968 because general surgery felt that they didn't need otolaryngologists, and they graduated their last resident in '71. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so there was nothing here. But who? Manis had left money. Yeah, mm -hmm. Manis had left money. Uh, for a department, and the money was sitting there, and I don't know all the logistics, but so in uh, the 80s, they started looking for a chairman. But nobody in their right mind would come here because you'd be a chairman of nothing because there wasn't anybody here. I mean, there wasn't a department since uh, 71. Well, I'll ask you, it wasn't quite all that. Was What's that? Until the chairman of the surgery retired. Yeah, yeah. That they they got doctor's doctor's surgery. surgery. That's part of we it. were a division. Yeah. We're going to be a division of. Yeah. And the money had been left for the person to be the chairman of the department of otolaryngology. Okay. So that was kind of a, you can talk more about that in a minute. Yeah. Okay. All right. So anyway, so uh, Bob came down here and looked, and uh, yeah, because he was interested in being a chairman, and asked me if I would join him, and then Jim could talk about how he got to know Bob. So we came. <laughs> It was overwhelming because we had nothing. I still do, and I can remember this very well, because I brought case cards down because it, nobody had done any major cases. They, the guys in the community would come by once every two weeks and maybe do positive and tubes, but there weren't any real case cards. So we ordered all these instruments. I remember at 3 o'clock in the morning, we were at the Vanderbilt Plaza Hotel. Asaf was very much into uh, electronics, and he had a, uh, this is down on 1986, but he had a computer and he had a, uh, a heat printer. So we were there working away at three o'clock in the morning, trying to get a budget proposed and stuff for uh, buying equipment. So we came here and we were inundated with cases. The big thing in the surgery locker room was our colleagues would ask us, "Where'd all these patients come from?" Yeah, you know, we were pretty busy. The community was very supportive of having uh, a tertiary care center for all of the tough cases that they had, including a lot of airway cases that we used the uh, laser on. So anyway, so the lady that was in charge of the operating room one night called the meeting and we went into the uh, room and she had the, the big long you know, card tables with all the instruments on and she said, sort these instruments. <laughs> so we got the message because you know, there was just chaos as far as uh, instrumentation. We did have one general surgery resident that was lent to us. John? Uh, so that we had one person that uh, worked with us. So why did I come here? Well. Back at the Medical College of Wisconsin, you know, we were sort of a poor department, and times were changing, especially like for sinus surgery with endoscopes. And I didn't, at that time, see the future changing very rapidly for me there, but I saw an opportunity in coming here that I could be, you know, in the forefront of uh, otolaryngology. I'm sure we all felt like that, that we could develop a program that would be, reflect, you know, how, how we felt about uh, how we wanted to train residents and how we wanted to uh, take care of patients. And uh, a big plus for us is that Vanderbilt was very supportive, but not only financially, but also our colleagues to this day. Have all, we've always had a very collegial relationship with everybody, and that really made it possible for us to get to this point. And I, one thought I had, and Jim probably remembers this, and you do too, we had a consultant come in at some point, and they said someday uh, a new group will come in and take it to the next level. So, and that's happened. So they were right. That's a little bit in a nutshell, and I'll uh, yield the floor to other people. Can you hear this okay? It's amazing. I'm going to take another picture of this crowd out here. When we look at the crowd that Jim and I were looking at when we showed yeah. up, we saw, I don't I need to bring me back. I was in this residency. It was a horrible residency. I learned how to operate, not when to operate. I hardly ever saw faculty. Residents thought that this residents thought that this horrible. Uh, I was saved, then I came in my senior year and came out and did a month with Glass Spot in Jackson. And my eyes were open. It was phenomenal watching them operate, interacting with their fellow Denny Bodrad and Peter Rowland, both who 
went on to be a great apologist in terms of David Haynes. Um, and so I told Mike Glasscock one day, I said, I want to be just like you when I grow up. I want to come to Nashville. I want to be a neuropologist. And he said, why in the heck would you want to do that? We've got one and a half too many. What this city needs desperately is a head neck surgeon. You go be a head neck surgeon, I'll make you successful. Oh, that's good idea. So that's how I shifted. That's how I became a head neck surgeon. <laughs> Mike Glasscock told me one day I had a bad idea. <clears throat> so I went and applied for head neck fellowships. This is my, I'll tell you this because my wife saw my options were Indianapolis, Cincinnati, Chicago, New York, and Iowa City. And I went to Iowa City. When I said, told her we were going to Iowa City, she started sobbing. She handed me the globe, said, Where is it in the world? <laughs> That's my idea. So now I really wanted to come back into private practice in Nashville, Tennessee, and join Clyde Allen and Ron Kate. But the, and that was my whole goal go be a head neck fellow, come back, work with Glass Cotton, join a private practice. So halfway through the year, my eyes are being opened in academia, and so I come back to Vanderbilt to interview with, H. with Dr. Sawyers. Now, you guys have to understand, Dr. H. William Scott, God rest his soul, was of the old school of general surgery. He didn't want to learn God to exist. He didn't want anesthesia to exist. He said, all I need is a nurse at the head of it, do what I tell her to. Uh, and so when uh, a very famous doctor that us old folks know, Dr. Paul Ward, came here to become chairman in 19... 68, 69, he started doing a tremendous amount of head and neck surgery, and it wrangled Dr. Scott so much that he started looking at ways to get rid of him. And then Dr. Ward went to be chairman at UCLA and took it to great heights. So very shortly after that, Dr. Scott set, shut the department down. Many doctors, as Jim said, came to interview. One specifically, Jonas Johnson told me, he said, I came here to interview. And as I was sitting there at the desk of the chief of plastic surgery, Dr. Lynch, and these guys don't mind you telling them because they're dead. Okay. <laughs> they, they would have told you these stories too. Dr. Lynch put his feet up on his desk like this, in between the face of Dr. Johnson and him, so that all he saw was the bottom of his shoes and said, why in the hell would I ever want you to come here? So that's what it was like to interview for the chairmanship at Vanderbilt for about 15 years. <clears throat> so in uh, October of 86, during my 85 during my fellowship, I came down, Thanksgiving, I think. We came over and, and put a, had a meeting with Dr. Sawyers, the chairman of surgery, and I said, Sir, you're new. Uh, I know that someday you all want a department of otolaryngology. I have no idea where you're at. Dr. McBride and McCabe had already told me to go down and apply to be chair of the department if I had to do it in real estate. So uh, I came down and had an interview with Sawyers. He sat there cagely, scratching his chin the whole time. He said, son, I think there's a bright future for you at Vanderbilt. I told him I would like to even come into the Department of General Surgery and work until you develop the Department of Otolaryngology. He said, but there's a fellow named Ossoff on the horizon. Go talk to him. So a couple of months later, I met Bob and you in Chicago at the Triological uh, Winter Section meeting. If you've ever talked to Dr. Ossoff, he preached it. He's got the best masters of anybody in the entire world. Clinch is his master, it's about 30 times a second while he's talking to me. I'm sitting in this lobby and his masters are firing. I didn't know what to think of this guy. <laughs> but Bob had a vision. And so he brought Jim and I down here. And uh, I must say, when I was in Iowa, I had 20 residents at my beck and call. The fellowship was like being a professor there. I went in at 7.30, went home at 6.30, rode the bus back and forth. Residents did everything. Everything I could possibly need. We show up down here, and we walk in an operating room, and uh, five nurses all smiled and said, we have no idea what you are doing. What is this? And they held up a little microscope. I said, what is this anyway? And uh, I had a license. You didn't. I stopped didn't have a license, so they came and watched me for a couple of weeks operating. They would book cases. So it was, uh, Jim and I did not take a vacation for three years. You guys may hate me for saying this, but we needed business. We trolled the units at night to look for traits. We went down to the ER and talked to them and said, we're here. We want your fractured mandibles. We want your necks. Don't y'all hate me now? You guys might not have ever had to do this stuff before for us. We spent, I mean, we rarely went home. So the Ossoff was the chairman, the Cambridge the, was the resident. I was the intern for three years. Uh, and then we finally, uh, <coughs> Then these, we start begging these guys to come on board now up in Palmer. I'll talk a little bit about the early residents. For three years, we had general surgery residents who were very kind, 
very thoughtful and knew that they did not want to know what we wanted to do. They did not want to do what we were doing. They were forced to do it. But the VA, I went over there, and uh, I can remember Bill, Will Chapman and uh, John Yates, both of them senior residents, and they said, we are so glad you're here, Dr. Mandeville. Our staffing has been limited. I said, well, who's your staff? They said, John LeRae. You guys don't know this. John LeRae was in Buffalo. He had the most famous head in textbook at the time. I said, well, I didn't know John, Dr. LeRae had ever been here in Nashville. He goes, no, he's lying in the corner. See that textbook? He said, we just open it, flip through the pages while we're doing the cases. We're deaf. So they were thrilled to have us here. They, they, they still send these patients. <clears throat> when you start a residency, uh, you know, not everybody in the country wants to come join you. And so our first four, after three years, we had four residents. We interviewed and we tried to get residents and were not kicked out of other programs. And all they have, these four guys had wonderful letters. And not them could quote me kicked out of other programs. They turned out they all had. So <laughs> <laughs> it was just subtle how they kicked them out. But they ended up being good humans. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I can tell you privately some stories about them, but they ended up being good humans, and they're all in practice today, and they're all respected. And then, all of a sudden, then we, we after about four or five years, we started to get to interview real young doctors, not real young doctors, but doctors who were right out of their medical school who were interested in. So people took a risk on it. One of them was Dr. Haynes. One class above him was the first class we matched for five years. David was the second class for five years. Now, I just want to tell you guys, Dr. Haynes knows how to interview. Six, all of you all are. Six years. Huh? The six years. Six years. The two, it was a two and four. That was right. It was a two and four program. You guys are amateurs at how to interview. I've interviewed every one of you, and you're just amateurs. Dr. Haynes walks in my office from Memphis with a rack of ribs. Hello, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mary, I thought I'd bring you this rack of ribs. That's just, <laughs> that started our conversation. He was in. I mean, I, it, it took me years later to tell him that the maids had eaten the ribs that night. I put them in the refrigerator and forgot them. I never got to eat David's ribs. So we celebrated since then several times on ribs. I'll talk more a little later. That, that's kind of a fun part about the beginning. But Dr. Haynes, Dr. Al Ali, who's the chairman of plastic surgery in Abu Dhabi right now, Dr. Mark Bravick, Jeff Bravick, who is the chief of uh, photology at Baylor. Mark White, who did it, all these guys at your fellowship. Three of the top first four did your fellowship. It's crazy. I don't know where I went wrong. But it was, uh, I wouldn't trade those memories, but my wife and children, they didn't see us, did they, Jim? Yeah. We were just non existent uh, for three years. So if y'all ever feel like you're getting a little bit overworked, I sympathize with you. I like being with you. And then we begged, I was a uh, pediatric oncologist for a while. It was scary. I, Dr. Steve Gray came from uh, Cincinnati down and helped me do aperture stents. I could make McGovern nipples very well. I go over the peach unit. I trolled the new neonatal unit trying to see if there was business. Because, you know, it's all the stuff you have. It was because we were trollers, weren't we? Right. So uh, then we begged, I don't know, who came on next? The work came in Reese. Reese. Reese, yeah. Because all this was Reese, trauma, Reese and Schwaber. All this trauma I was generating, somebody had to help me do it. Now, I'll tell you this. I was the first person at Vanderbilt to use plating. I went away to Memphis, took a course in plating. Uh, plates were, we didn't use plates in our residency. Yeah. We just put surfamoral wires around the zygomatic arts and the teeth, put an arch bar on, cranked it up. Their face got about two inches shorter. These people had really, you know, really tight faces after we did <laughs> mid face. You know, the four twos, the four threes, and thank goodness. Put a pull out wire in. Put a pull out wire up here and zip it out. Yeah. That would shock the nurse. <laughs> so it was revolutionary to think that we could put in these plates and their face not just fall apart. So we would take a picture of the human and put it up above the case, and you would start putting plates on to try to make the face the same length as the picture that came in. So the plastic surgeon didn't use plates, none of them. I started using the Russell team and started using them. So there was a lot of first here. For us, he's got. I got you know. I guess I came next. Also, at that same time, Mitch Schwager came uh, to do otology, and I came to Nashville in '85. I was in private practice. In my personal statement it said nothing about being in academic medicine. It said I wanted to be in private practice east of the Mississippi. So I got that east of the Mississippi part right. 
But Bob Ossoff had been one of my junior attendings at Northwestern. And so when he first came to interview, he knew I was in town, so he called me up and said, come down here to Vanderbilt, to talk to me. What do you know about the community? I didn't know a whole heck of a lot. I'd only been here about over a year, a little less than that. But eventually, in 86, he convinced me to come down part-time. So I would come on Fridays. And that way he could say, well, I've got now a fellowship-trained facial plastic surgeon. And so that was the start of my <clears throat> academic career. And that's kind of backwards. Usually you start in academics and then you go into private practice. So I did it the other way. I think Dr. Haynes did it that way, too. But uh, the other story is I tell people I had a small TNA that brought me to Vanderbilt when I woke up. I was here and I never left. But um, it, Jim's right, we did use plates, and all the plates were stainless steel. <clears throat> and mandibular plates you had to take out. I didn't mind plating in my residency at all. I can remember one of my attendings, who was a joint plastic surgeon, ENT, was all excited at Cook County saying, look, I see this, these these little hand mini frag plates to fix the face. I'm going, no, I don't, I don't want to mess with that. You know? So again, I had to take a course once I got out. To learn how to do plating. Um, after about two years in '88, my group split up, and so I came full time, and I've been here ever since, 30 years now. Uh, one of the interesting things at the time, I had a contract with the Tennessee State Prison. This actually started with Glasscock's fellows, where they would see all the prisoners out of the old prison, and then they take all the ears and they give the rest to whoever had the other part of the contract eventually evolved to where I was screening all the patients and send the ears to them. So that was a really good deal for the residents. So we could go out to the prison and operate, or we could go to that, some other hospitals that had the contract for a while, and it ended up at Meharry. And that, that fell by the wayside, I guess, about 10 years after that. One of the other, old, from the residents, I don't, where did Mark Kleiner fit in? Was he, oh, he, was, he was after David, two years after David. Four years after, so he was one of our early residents, of course, is now part of our fellowship. There's been a tremendous growth. Um, I wouldn't have been here if it hadn't been for Bob Ossoff. It's um, been a great ride. Had some amazing residents and now amazing fellows. Thank you. Um, I actually came in 1989, so they've been here for about three years to start things. Um, where to start? Uh, the things that, that Dr. John Cage and Dr. Venerable uh, left out was that when Bob came down and interviewed for this job, he designed a prospectus and gave it to the chief of surgery and said, after five years, I expect to have five faculty and two residents per year and we'll be in X number of cases, et cetera, et cetera. And he was wildly off. Um, I think in five years, we had about nine faculty and, and two residents per year, we think of getting three residents per year, and I think they had doubled the number of expected cases they were going to do, and Vanderbilt was just ecstatic to have EMT here. Um, so Bob wildly underestimated the need for, for EMT down here, and I think so did Vanderbilt. So he, he built something from nothing, and it took off a little bit faster than he thought it was going to, but it was an interesting ride that started there. We put on the front of the, uh, the, the curl since then. <laughs> it's just continued to go. Uh, when I came down, uh, Dr. Ossoff was here, Dr. Neverville, uh, Dr. Benkovich, Dr. Reese, Dr. Uh, Schwaber, and Dr. Coleman was yeah. covering the general hospital about Second Avenue, which eventually merged with Meharry. Dr. Zeeler was in charge of research. I came from Chicago, um, and with all due respect to Dr. Neverville, I think my residency program was worse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the actual highlight of my program was the fact that Dr. Reese was my chief resident of Cook County. So I do. I did know Dr. Reese when I came down and eventually lived in the program. But uh, um, I knew Dr. Ossoff in Chicago as well. We had crossed paths multiple times. We've done research at the Lenski Laser Center at Ravenswood Hospital up in Chicago. I've known him through Cook County. And um, I took off after residency and went to do a pediatric fellowship. And in residency, I knew Dr. Zeeler because we did research in Irving, Chicago, and together and presents their research. So you know what the other programs are doing. So I actually knew three of the people before I even came down here. But my research, and, and you all know my interests are in lasers and optical physics. I was doing research uh, in lasers. And then I went to residency, or sorry, to fellowship, and it was continued to do research, and had presented a paper in Boston in regard to the side of laser medicine surgery in April. 
and ran into Dr. Ossoff again and said, hey, I just came down to Vanderbilt and started this program down there. We need a PDM and EMT. Why don't you take a look at us? It's like, you know, Dr. Ossoff is still going to want to do your fellowship again. Yeah. So well, that's, that's great. That's great. Just, just keep us in mind. And about four weeks later, I got a call from him. He was having the Second International Laser Congress down here. And he needed somebody to give a talk on ultra pulse CO2 lasers and call a gentleman named Dr. Kerry Fuller, who was the, 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 the principal investigator and um, developer of ultra pulse CO2. And Terry couldn't help. And so Dr. Rossoff said, Well, you know, I'm going to invite. And Terry said, Well, yeah, there's this guy, you may know him, he's from Chicago. He's really only a resident. You know, I'm working. I'm working. Yeah, it's okay. So Bob called me and said, you know, you've all CO2 lasers. I said, yeah, I said, okay, I need you to come down and do a talk. So I came down for the Congress, and Dr. Ossoff's daughter had just been born in Chicago before that. She was preemie. And so he's trying to coordinate getting back and forth to Chicago, seeing Leslie and running this conference. And Russell takes me from Opryland and brings me down here. And at the time, the department was in the round room, and it was the entirety of the round room. The clinic was up there, the department was up there, and the offices were up there. It was just around them. Those were some great offices. <laughs> they were great offices. They, they were in the shower. You imagine a high shaped office with your own bathroom. Yeah. Okay. And no, no other attendees' office around here, is, 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 except possibly D3300, has their own you know, private bathroom. But we all have private bathrooms up there in the, in the round room. With a little window to pass out urine samples if you yeah. need to. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so, so I inherited all the patients that Dr. Netterville had done through Steve Gray and said, here, Jay, here, I've been saving these LPPs for you, saving these airway cases. Here, so glad that you're here. I'm not doing any more peas ever again. <laughs> so, um, and it sort of took off from there. I can't remember the first residence. Just remember, do you remember the one resident we had, though? Well, we had this uh, guy who was, uh, had completed a full EMT residency in Egypt and came over here and was looking for a U.S. license. And Jim used to joke that so whenever I had questions, I'd ask him what to do because he'd already done it. <laughs> and so it was great to have him on service. That was Sharif. Sharif yeah, yeah. yeah, he was fabulous. Yeah. Then he had to go back and do his internship. Yeah. Oh, remember that after he finished the ENT? You know, you know, we used to be a, a laser center. I mean, we were giving laser courses here four, <clears throat> four times a year, covering both CO2 and all the other wavelengths. I also realized back then, CO2 was big, and I guess you did some NDA. Yeah. But all the other yeah. lasers, no, nobody in ENT used really KTP or argon. Yeah. Well, actually, like the dye laser hadn't even didn't, didn't yeah. exist. Well, a funny thing on the neodymium YAG laser, you know, they didn't have any lasers installed there, so we got the YAG laser installed, and it has to be water cooled. Remember that? So, yeah. so guess what would happen? Because <laughs> up north, you know, the water, the tap water never gets above 50, because like right. Michigan stays about 50 in the summertime, colder in the winter. So here they would shut off because it would overheat. <laughs> they put a cool chiller they, on the roof. Yeah, and they had to run in all sorts of high electrical, you know, high they, capacity they, they electrical. Put a, they put a chiller on the roof to make them the yeah. like water temperature cool enough yeah. to cool the lasers. So but no, actually, <clears throat> actually they did have KTP when I started down here. What happened is at that particular era, they, they invented or developed the concept of endoscopic cholecystectomy, mm -hmm. and all the general surgeons thought, like, "Great, this is fantastic." You can a laser to take on gallbladder. They didn't, general surgeons didn't realize that the technological advance was the fact that general surgeons were now looking through a telescope, which we've been doing since the 60s. Um, and so the, the laser company, Laser Scope, um, went around to all these, these, these hospitals and said, You need to buy this laser. It slices and dices and chops and goes through the fries. You can use it for general surgery, you can use it for everything else. And so they sold all these lasers around the country. And then the general surgeons realized they could use a bogey just to easy as they could use the KPP and not worry about backscatter. And they got better results. So the laser sat in the corner. There was a local guy in town, ENT, who then started using the KPP laser for tonsils. It was the, the painless tonsillectomy. And he claimed that it never ever bled because he was old enough he never took call. His partner said to see all the post-op patients. We saw them here because they bled. But then he started traveling around the country on a six-figure retainer contract for laser scope to promote the KPP laser for ENT. Um, I've forgotten that. Uh, yeah, yeah, so that was that was about that time. So, but what questions do people have for us? If, if we get going, we can talk. Let's talk about our first interview. Oh, here, I got this. So, Doctor Duncanbridge and I came down for our first official interview for our wives. Uh, there was going to be Perry Harris, and he was a like ENT and he was a plastic surgeon. He worked with us, Doctor. He was sliding at the time, and getting you know trying to slow down. But he was great friends with the operator. 
and he loved the film. And so we went to Perry's house, and we, we and he's going to take us. We went to dinner, and we went to the opera. So on the way there, we all pile in these two cars and go over to Grand Ole Opry. And I, I've grown up in Nashville. I've been to the Opry twice in my life as teenagers to make fun of it. That's what we did. You know, it's out the back row now. But you know, now it's a really wonderful thing. So when we get there, Dr. Harris pulls open his trunk and pulls out, and this is just now, a gallon jug of Jack Daniels. He said, anybody want to sip before we go in? So he threw it over his shoulder, and he guzzled the whole bunch, and he offered it around. We kindly declined. Yeah. Remember that? that oh, I remember it very well. Trunk. Yeah. <laughs> it was kind of shocking, though. Well, uh, so then we go in the back door, we go, we go right into Roy Acuff's dressing room. Yeah. Some of you neophytes don't know who Roy Acuff is. He's one of the greatest country music singers of all time, and he ended up being, he was a real gentleman. He, he loved, people loved him. So we went right in his dressing room and sat down with Mr. Acuff, and people would come to go to speak to him. And, and then he offered us all orange juice. And so we had a guy, his orange juice only had about this much orange juice, and he went around the corner and he came back and his glass was really full. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there was a lot of this going on yeah. there at the Opry. We sat on the stage at the Opry, and uh, it was a remarkable event get to see the behind the stage of what I had made fun of all my childhood days, these crazy old coots to see these wonderful, lovely humans who were some of the kindest these country music stars of all the people I met at that point. <clears throat> so that was our, our introduction, Jim's introduction to Nashville. Mm -hmm. I had grown up here, so uh, you kind of wonder what was this about. Okay. So I'm, I come down here, I'm in clinic, and uh, I'm not violating any HIPAA rules here, but I have no clue that they were I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. This is a, the Midwest, we don't have any country or western stations up there. And I still don't have any country or western stations on my car. 12, 12 stations on the radio and no country or western. So I'm doing a clinic, and I'm standing there in the nurse's station. The nurse's station, that's Johnny Cash. I said, who? I said, Johnny Cash. I said, who? I said, the guy in the corner. I said, who? I said, the guy in the corner in the black. I said, no, who's Johnny? <laughs> and this got back to Dr. Oslo. And then they got back to him about several other people. And I'm taking a patient, checking him off, checking him out. I walk in front, somebody's talking to somebody, so I slid my patient in front of him. It turned out that somebody I shouldn't have slid in front of him. And so I'm walking past his office one day. I said, Jay, come in here. Go in my office, I'm in trouble. You know? And he says, sit down. I don't do deep trouble here, so I'm sitting down in the chair and on the couch. There's this coffee table in front of him. Oh, the coffee table is a big book. It says Illustrated History of the Grand Ole Opry. He says, take that book home, read it, know those people. They're my patients who are embarrassing me. <laughs> well, I remember one night, uh, yeah, Asaf would call him frequently, probably called you too, a better time. Yes, he called me about, I was in bed, he called me about 11 o'clock at night. He said, I had this idea, you know, because Nashville you know, has all the country music singers and they're not professionally trained. So he said, we need to have a voice center. That's, that's the concept of how the voice center got started. It was an original idea. Well, the real backstory behind that was that we had a young doctor in town, Dr. Quisling, and maybe Dr. Quisling didn't follow the singers that we follow, but he was seeing a lot of the professional singers. And then a very powerful administrator at Baptist Hospital built a huge unit over there to attract the country music singers. The rooms, the family rooms were suites. It was unbelievable. If you remember those suites, they were massive. And so you had a kitchen in it, you had a room, a bathroom, and a family room to be in. And uh, <clears throat> they had approached Springfield. I mean, they had approached uh, Quisling to come over and run that unit. We were five years in, and Dr. Ossoff was begging the university to give us some money to start voicing. And, um, and so the, I, don't know, I don't want to digress too much here. But I had, uh, I had gone over to Baptist a lot to work with Dr. Glass, Dr. Jackson, so I'd gotten to know the doctors over there. The way we got Johnny Cash is Dr. Glasgow asked me to see Jim Carter Cash. I put some afro in her nose, put a scope in, a mucus plug came out, she jumped out of bed, she hugged me, you cured me, Dr. Netterville, you're my doctor. Now, when I came here, I really wanted to be Doctor of the Stars. I've told you guys a lot of this. Dr. Ossoff wanted to be Doctor of the Stars. Okay, look at this. Southern boy, Nashville, Tennessee, Boston Jewish guy. Who's going to win being Doctor of the Stars? Me or Dr. Ossoff? You know, I don't know. <clears throat> so, John, then Jim comes in a few times to see me, and I say, man, you got to bring in Johnny. He goes, good. So she starts bringing Johnny Cash in to see me. So I saw him for a while. First time I ever tried to look at his nose, he came in with stuffy nose. He said, so Mr. Cash, I'm going to look at your nose. He goes, nobody touches my nose. I said, well, okay. I 
nuts. In this case, I'm your nose doctor. Nobody touches my nose. So I said, why? Well, it turns out he just had weird procedures in New York City about a month before to decrease his nasal halo. And he was a lovely man. Both he and his wife were lovely, lovely people. And so then I finally got to look at his nose, and he had a cold, and I gave him the script for a decongestant antibody and some acrid. And when I gave him these scripts, he covered them up with his hand. He says, now, young doctor, are you sure you want me to take these scripts? I said, yes, sir. I think this is a wise idea. I don't think it'll hurt you. Singing. Are you sure, young doctor? I said, he goes, I've been addicted to everything I've ever taken in my life. Are you sure? So I, you know, after about six months, I decided this was not my calling. So I went out one day and got Dr. Ossoff and I brought him back to him and said, Mr. Cash, meet Dr. Ossoff, Dr. Ossoff, meet Mr. Cash, this is your new patient. So that was, that's when I kind of got out of professional voice. So, I mean, it, it was wonderful. They are wonderful, wonderful patients. But my head and neck practice was building so much I couldn't do both. Uh, so, and then Dr. Garrett took over the real boss <laughs> of all of this. <clears throat> when you look at academic production, how do we change? <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> here we were neophytes. I had no academic grounding except my fellowship. Jim had some, Bob had some, but we have to give, go back and give credit to Dr. Ossoff. You know, we always gave him a hard time because he came here. He really wanted to be on laryngology. He didn't want to be an open surgeon. He gave all the open surgery to Jim and I. And he, he gave all the pediatrics. Russell came in, took a lot of the trauma. Schwaber was doing some of the ear cases. But Bob had a vision. He said, I want you guys quickly in the trial logic. He said, I want you, we started running courses. And that's what Dr. Evie has pushed us to run courses. I feel bad. I don't run as many courses. So I had a medialization of rhinoplasty course. I ran twice a year when people came from all over the country and the world. They had the laser course four times a year. People came from all over. We started a soft tissue workshop for training programs. So Vanderbilt, in a very early program, was putting on eight to ten academic programs every year in Nashville. It was three years before I ever published a paper. I didn't have any data, didn't have anything to publish on. And then we, but we were so crazy busy that we were building some of the largest series in the world right here in Nashville, Tennessee, because we had no competition in it. And so that's kind of what, and so I think I was the youngest member of the Trilogic Society at the time. I was the youngest member of the ALA, not because I would have done it, but Dr. Ossoff pushed me forward. He was pushing you, all of us, to do that. So he had a, an academic vision for us, which is very helpful. So when Sometimes we push you guys, or we kind of say you do this, you know, maybe look at it as well. It's like when my parents tried to get me to do something, I thought they were an idiot. Just maybe listen to that wisdom a little bit when you get pushed here and there. Yeah, as Jim was talking, I was... Oh, is that on? Okay, I'll try to do that. Reminded me of how I got into doing sinus work. When we came here, we did actually have a lot of sinus patients also. And I was trained in intranasal laparotectomy, and you had more external approach, I think, Bob did too. So all of a sudden, one day I woke up and all I was doing was sinus work, essentially. I realized that the only codes I knew were the ICD-9 codes, now ICD-10 for sinus work. So that's when we started doing endoscopic sinus surgery, came out in 86, 87. The first paper was written by Kennedy in 86 in regard to endoscopic antrostomy. So I went and took Jim Stankowitz's course up at Loyola, and we started, you know, Vanderbilt was very supportive. We had bought all of us had already bought all the endoscopic instruments. So in 1988, we started training. I trained 60 people a year in endoscopic sinus surgery here. Everybody wanted to That's right. learn how to do it because the it's the future. So we were doing, we had so many courses going on, as you said. And that's how sinus got started, and then it just took off from there. That's all I did then later on. In the beginning, we were all doing a lot of airway reconstructions, a lot of head and neck cancer, but then we all sort of found our own little niches, just as you did. And then you Dr. Reese became world famous for Osler Weber Rondeau. It was just oh, fabulous. Can I tell you know what I got though? Yeah. We Somehow. started sending all the patients yeah. to him. And <laughs> Well, you'll have, uh, you'll have yeah, it. You were doing it. <laughs> yeah, I was. somehow it came over to my side. Well, I don't know how that happened. Yeah, how did you borrowed the slide? You were a lot smarter, smarter than I was. That was on a Saturday morning. Fred Sucker was here. We were doing a laser course. And I think you gave the t I gave you my slide. That and you gave the talk. Right. <laughs> yeah. One of the two things in, in my yeah. area you don't want to ever write about yeah. um, cephal perforation, that's right. changing, yeah. but definitely HHT. Yeah. 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, in pediatrics, you never want to write about neonatal nasal obstruction. <clears throat> so relative to you all, uh, you need to know how the residency has changed. When we started here, it was a two and four program. And it was set up as a two and four program because my doctor also came from Northwestern. It was a two and three program up there because our system insisted it be a two program. Because in order to be a member of the two different societies for head and neck, one of them you had to be a member from ENT, the other was from general surgery, and you couldn't be a member unless you had done two years of general surgery. And so in order to keep people eligible to join both head and neck societies, this was a two and four program. And after the program started growing a little bit, we started trying to compose on saying, uh, two and four, two and four, we're not getting the residents we want, we have to go to the one and four and finish out the year early. Um, and so eventually, uh, after about six or eight years, it morphed into a one and a half, four and a half, and we got the uh, half year of research in the, in the second year. Um, and we started taking that half year back, and uh, the department became uh, an independent department, and we were actually completely back off to a one and five program. And then the next development was the fact that we were allowed to decide where our interns were going to be located rather than have that direct <coughs> for general surgery. That kind of segues into fellowships. I guess laryngology was the first fellowship. Yeah. No, it wasn't. No? Well, which one? <laughs> head and neck or laryngology? It was. Head and neck was first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll let y'all figure that out. I, definitely, I know facial plastics was last. Okay. They started taking two fellows faster than I did, so they got a couple more fellows. But I, our fellowship started at 90. Uh, so Kaylin, way before I should have had a fellow. <laughs> were, you, were you the first? You were the first? No, no Mark Corey was first. Mark Corey was the first, and that was 92. And uh, then Glenn Gardner was 93. And then you and Mike Kirk. We were the first to do a full seat. Yeah, and, the, and just, just to make it well known, I mean, you all know Dr. Uh, Garrett's uh, just obsessiveness with her training program and where she grew up, but her co-fellow at that time was Die Hard Duke. And so they were stuck in a mountains together. Yeah, look who's here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When did the yeah. Rhinology Fellowship start? Yeah, the History of Neurology Fellowship is, you know, I had a discussion with Otsoff over many years in regard to starting a fellowship. But he wouldn't budge because he was concerned that the, that the residents weren't getting enough ethmoidectomies, which they really were. Uh, anyways, in the year 2000, uh, when we had the first uh, rhinology film. And Peds came after that. Peds came after We're the last one. So. started. <coughs> Questions? 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 Well, let me tell you about the clinics, you guys. Yeah, we, had the round, we started in the round wing on a sixth floor. And I think you can remember this too, and Joe. Who's been married to Randy Fullerton now, who's an internist in town? Uh, and, and Kathy Key would point me, it was half of a half of a semicircle. So we would be going still at six o'clock at night. And you remember how Dr. Offsaw would say, well, he would have a patient, he wasn't sure what he was going to do with him. He said, well, I've got the world's expert here, it's either you or me. So there would be one more patient. You can identify with that too, game of Yeah. So, anyways, the nurses would, yeah, we'd be tired. They bought me, uh, Oh, one jolt. <laughs> I had two cans of jolt. Well, I was wired. I mean, but they would point me because it's a semicircle, so they would aim me at the room and give me a push. And that's how we sort of finished up our days. All right. Well, in the meantime, they were going to build the wrap the the Vanderbilt Clinic. They paid consultants to come up with the name of the Vanderbilt Clinic. So the Vanderbilt Clinic. And we and we were given five thousand square feet, I think, in there on the first floor. So I remember sitting in San Francisco at one of the academy meetings at the airport. Asaf had given me the plans and he had talked about some ideas and stuff. And when we put together how we're going to lay out the room there with the ponds. You know. So then we moved into there in 88. We were there for a couple of years and then eventually we outgrew it. But we had no place to go. But Pete's was on the second floor. So Pete's moved out. But Vanderbilt didn't want to spend any money to renovate the place. So <laughs> we were in these tiny little rooms, I mean, they were kind of, some of them were really weird. So we were in there for a long time. And that's, that's when we came here from there then? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And then they finished this building, but they ran out of money. So we could look over across the street at it, but we couldn't move into it because it wasn't well, finished out yet. Well, I see they didn't run out of money. But they had the money, but it got siphoned off from this building to start the next building. Okay. And from that building to start the next building. And it was always, we were three buildings yeah. ahead building and never finishing the build-out. 
So one day I was over there seeing patients in the second floor, and they said, you can come and pick out your office. I have the first choice. <laughs> you got the best view. Yeah, I, I was going to take the one next to the C Bank. Is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah, but, but I walked down the hall and saw how, what a great view that was out of the office I got, which who has it now? Uh, one of your life or yeah. Or, I don't know. yeah, it was a great view. I never got to really see it much, though. <laughs> Oh, and the other thing I thought about is going through these questions, and we all can identify with that. When we came here, we didn't have any nurse really assigned to work with us. And I remember one time, I, we, when we moved to S2100 Medical Center North, my wife went by there one day to get something, and the people at the said, oh, Dr. Van Cambridge is a woman. <laughs> Meaning that they never saw me, because we went through there early and came back late at night, and we were never in the office when there was anybody there. But the thing that was happening to us is the messages. Remember how we'd go to our mothers and the door would be plastered with these pink messages. And we had nobody else to delegate those to. So in 1988, I think you and I talked about No cell phones. phones. Yeah, no cell phones. People yeah. actually answered their house phone. Yeah. yeah. So we actually then got, we got pretty <coughs> first nurse. So pretty was one of the first yeah. dedicated nurses. Yeah. In the department. And I had Karen Brunley. And so we had somebody eventually, after we had got us off, to get us somebody. So the messages would just build up. I would come in, I'd have a ton of messages. So I would just triage them. And if was somebody calling that I'd operate or I'd lead it, then that would be my first one to call. But we could never answer all the messages back then. It's gotten a lot better now, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so go forward a few years and explain the uh, science of the ASAP. ASAP so. Oh, yeah. Well, with all the stuff going on with the sinus, I felt that, and this is when nurse practitioners just came up, we needed a coordinated approach using uh, algorithms on treating uh, sinus patients, because it was very, very disorganized. A sinus patient had three doctors taking care of an allergist, uh, an internist, and sometimes a pulmonologist, and an ENT doctor, actually, for them. So everybody told them something different. So at that time, then, we started working. Asaf and I went to talk to, uh, what was the chance of the vice chancellor? Uh, Ike Robinson. Ike Robinson. Uh, we talked to him one evening, and it went on and on and on. My wife, we had an exchange student with us that wanted to go and see where Elvis Presley lived. My wife was out in the car with the kids waiting to drive over to Memphis to stay overnight and go. So we finally got out around 10 o'clock at night, drove over there in the middle of the night. But anyways, he was uh, accepting of the ideas. That's how the ASAP thing got started, the Asthma Science Allergy Program. It started as a coordinated approach to treating science patients. Jay, I want to one thing. You're talking about ASAP too. Yeah. I was going to say, so hidden in there is this comment about the algorithms. Please note Dr. Duskage was the first olaryngologist to actually design algorithms for the management of patients in olaryngology. Yeah, it took, it, it took us two years. We worked with uh, Jim Brasikowski in internal medicine, uh, Bobo Tanner, and, uh, and myself. Uh, we did that every Friday. We worked on it <coughs> for two years. Yeah. I kind of got lost and forgot to finish the story about the voice center. But, in fact, about five or six years of my going back and forth to Baptist meeting people, they called me one day and asked me to come over and I had a chat with their senior leadership and they said, we'd like to start a voice center here. And so I interviewed with them a couple of times knowing I wasn't about to go, but I came back and I laid everything out to Dr. Ossoff and I said, this is everything they're offering at Baptist. Go tell the administrators that Netterville's going to start a voice center across the way. So he went and told Ike Robinson and the dean that Netterville was leaving to start a voice center, and they gave us a million dollar loan and opened up in the village of Vanderbilt. We had a beautiful voice center there, and I think we eventually had to pay all that money back to the university. <clears throat> the one other thing you guys need to know about the Bill Wilkerson Center, and I think we've gone over this to some degree other times. The Bill Wilkerson Center was a not for profit, private, Hear, hearing and speech foundation across about two blocks off campus. And Fred Best ran it. Fred's one of the most lovable, wonderful humans in the world. But eventually, as we were growing and they were growing, Fred figured they, they said they've got to donate their world back into Vanderbilt. So that's how this building got built. And Dr. Ossoff and Dr. Uh, <clears throat> Best got together. And then the Bill Wilkerson Center had a remarkable group of very wealthy people in town that were supporting them the board of the Bill Wilkerson Center. So they were gonna build this entire building for us. Then they started sliding cardiology in and orthopedics in, but we still have you know, the top four floors out of this building. So this was a, a merger of two big entities. So there's very few places in the country where you have a speech and hearing center, world class and open communication centers, all under one roof, 
working together. We had hoped that we would meet at the coffee problem more. I think that the, we do in speech pathology and voice, we do a lot in otology, neurotology. Uh, so it has been a kind of, you know, you bring a lot of brains together and a lot of good things happen out of that. I mean, we're talking a little bit more modern here, but I do need to answer the, the, the comment to it. That I think that when you add together the Olofsen side and the Olofsen side, the, the employees that are under that umbrella, I think it's the biggest system in the United States. It beats Michigan's Kresge Institute, doesn't it? That would be the only one close to that size. That's right, but I know, you know, I think Harvard is just really remarkable. But I mean, you, what is it, what is the total now? Four hundred and seventy-five employees under your control. No, total is five hundred. Well, over five hundred, right? So. Training, including the masters and doctors, and all the So considering nineteen eighty-six, there was zero, and now it's over five hundred. You know, the the strength of this department over time is not us. Is the people we've trained, and we've been either very, very fortunate or reasonably good at picking young doctors. And so when we look at the, I look around this room and see some of you guys that I have touched personally in your training that we've all touched, and now some of these guys right here are world class superstars in the world, all graduating from the Vanderbilt program. When you look at other, we're only 30 years old, 32 years old. And we've made an impact in the world because of you guys. And so all people often say, well, why didn't you go work with my brother across town at cardiothoracic anesthesiologist? He makes twice what I make, two and a half times what I make. He points that out often. <laughs> and I says, because the love we had for training young doctors, I mean, we went through hell. You know, when I get to, when I get to heaven, I'm going to get a little bit of both of us, because we've been through so much hell down here. You know, uh, we've already done some of our hell time uh, down here on Earth. And some of it's recreating again right now, I must say. Uh, because the love of what we did here at the university, and to get to go to the academy meeting and, and see so many people, and to look around the world and see how many people have grown through this family that are wonderful, hardworking doctors. You know, somebody called me from Dallas the other day. I'm the first time I know down there and said, I've got a science problem, I don't like university. I pick up the phone call, Keith McBean, who's one of our first, he was the first five year group. They were the first five year group, like they wanted for. I said, Keith, would you call this guy? I called him. I get a big pot of flowers the next day from this family saying, This doctor is fabulous. I mean, that's our, our offspring, you guys are great. And we look around this room and it, it just gets even better and better, I think. <laughs> Who has questions for us? <coughs> yes, David. I did my first image science case with you in 1986. Can you tell the story of the, of the uh, six foot tall girl? Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. These guys don't know. No, well, yeah, you have to realize that we grew up before there was uh, CT scans. <laughs> so, yeah, the first coronal low window CT scan came out in 1986 or 87. Before that, they were axials. And the axials were more of a uh, soft tissue window, so they really didn't show. Or, you the remember tomography? I mean, oh yeah, we we did tomography. We came here yeah. and didn't have tomography. But CTs, you could you could change the attenuations, but you could change it manually. Yeah, yeah. So what happened with sinus surgery, getting the the image guy, that is that when the coronal bone window CT scan came out, the way it averaged, they were only like they were what, eight millimeter cuts. I forget how many views that were not very many. But every ethmoid looked like it was ethmoid sinusitis. So now we had a hammer, which was the endoscopic uh, tech stuff and the equipment, and now we had everybody had headaches, sinus headaches. And all right, so anyways, getting to the image guy, that, that first one was really very difficult to use. And so with the six foot call bone was, uh, I, I don't remember what the ratio was, but it's life size, and you cut it out. And you would lay it on the. Uh, I remember that. So, so don't yes. forget, you take a regular plain film at yes. six feet away. The patient yes, has to stand six feet away from the cone. Right. And then they hand you the picture. Then you cut it and out. You cut out the sinus. And you paste it on the face and say, "This is where the sinus is on." Well, this was image guidance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that was before image guidance. 
Yeah, but Mark Wydeck was David's uh, resident mate. Mark Mark was a big guy. He played football in uh, high school, maybe college, and he was also an engineer. And I remember have I still remember this to this day. For some reason, we weren't sure about the six foot Caldwell, so he was going to shine a light around. Anyway, so he wanted me to cut where the light was. But had we done that, I would have been calling neurosurgery. Luckily, it <laughs> worked out. But you always had the, you know, that's a lost art. We had, because we don't need to do it anymore now. It's really been a big advancement. I mean, there were tough cases. We did help a lot of patients, but life has changed for the better, technically. All right, other questions? So you I, that, and this is a, a good problem you've worked at over there. This, that's the third design of the building. Uh, I went through several different design iterations before that. But uh, I was told to plan for four and, and no nurse practitioner. And uh, that's wildly under, <coughs> under the, what we need and obviously the worst of the scene. And, so yeah, I think mean, it's, it's the same mistake Dr. Ossoff made when he came. He completely underestimated the demand for what was here uh, it's taken off. So. The other thing too, that you should talk about, I mean, one of the things that really set this, this program apart was the I have to say, relationship with you all with us. I, mean, I really appreciate that. I talked about I talked about how when Peter you that yeah, we want to get the best residents in that during the initial phase, yes, but your teachers we eventually hope to become your mentors and your friends because once you graduate you'll be our colleagues. And that philosophy is extended to that. We have parties after hours. We were the first interview group to have the, the Thursday night and Friday night meet and then soon every other program in the country was doing that. Uh, uh, so we've, we've made several advancements. And we were young enough when we got here that we decided early on we were trying to minimize the call schedule for the residents because only over one of us had been on every third night during our residency or every fourth night. And rapidly try to get as fast as we could to make it as easy as we could on you all and make it out, out, not in house call. I mean, the initial phase was in house call, you would sit around and wait for something to, to come because that was the way it was done. And we pointed out that we had to collect the data and show, you know, this is how many times they actually get called. They could probably be in their own bed and still make it back in fairly easily. So we could try to. to advance some of the training here to try to make the, the lifestyle for the residents as best we can. Obviously we can control the hours because in part we outnumber you all still. We have more attending to the residents. It's, it, when people interview here and the residents go by, I use the military term and say target rich environment. You have to decide what you're going to miss that day. Um, so but, it, this program really, despite the fact that you're on taking care of patients, it's always been otherwise about teaching, which is about you all and about the fellows. That's why we're up now to have any residents and fellows that we have. And, and we have listened to feedback from the residents. I can remember you guys can back me up, but I don't forget what class it was. People started complaining, we're operating too much. I mean, we don't get to go see anybody in the clinic. And so we had to yeah. adjust things. Yeah. Yeah, that was a problem with the sinus because really the whole art you all know this in, in evaluating a sinus patient is the history and the physical exam and, and reviewing your uh, imaging studies. The surgery is you know, pretty straightforward eventually. And the big thing is the post-operative care, but the residents didn't get either one. You know? <laughs> they got to be good technicians, but then we worked that out after we had the discussion with the residents. All right, it's time to go. What was, what was your guys' life like in 1991? 1991. Uh, don't go there. They weren't born. The intern spent all day long trying to find x-rays around the hospital. Oh, yeah. The residents spent all day long trying to find charts. And so even our evening rounds, trying to figure out what we were going to do the next day, was this unbelievable effort of getting data together so we could look at it. And half the time, you couldn't find it. So as much as I hate Epic and to be able to sit down at one piece of machine and find all this data very quickly is remarkable. Okay, before we finish, just to put it in perspective here, show of hands, how many of you were not born when the department started here in 86? <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, yeah, I remember them. Yeah. <laughs> getting x-rays was really a problem. The nurses used to have to put them in the back room because tech, you know, now practice-wise, if you didn't have the uh, CT scan, you couldn't do sinus surgery. If you didn't have any operating room. So, do you remember Columbus? Sorry, sorry to put that in perspective. For, for, yeah, would somebody go get our walkers and wheelchairs yeah. and <laughs> check this out? Any more stories? slides or pictures is, I, mean, I, even, I had a camera, I took pictures of every patient of everything, we never took pictures of anything else, there's no pictures of the department, so I started to bring in a carousel projector, it set up and just let it click in the background so you all get a sense of uh, what Grand Rounds used to be, we didn't take pictures of Grand Rounds, or meetings, meetings. Yeah.